the title of the talk is uh, uh, Scalable Zero Knowledge via Cycles of Elliptic Curves. Uh, the, um, this is joint work with Eliven Sasson, uh, Rand Tromer, and Madras Virza. So <clears throat> we are in the zero knowledge session. This talk is about zero knowledge. Specifically, uh, we today we focus on non-interactive zero knowledge. Okay, so let me remind you the setting of uh, non-interactive zero knowledge, or NIZK, as we call it uh, uh, in short. So at the start of time, there is a, a generator G that takes a bunch of uh, random coins and produces a set of public parameters that we uh, usually call common reference string, or CRS for short. Uh, the CRS can be used uh, to prove statements, like uh, you know, is an instance X uh, in a language L. Uh, and any prover can use the CRS to produce a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof for such statements. And it can also be used uh, uh, to verify such proofs by, say, the verifier. And in a sort of beautiful line of work from the 80s and 90s, we know that uh, under various cryptographic assumptions, we know how to obtain an Isaac K for sort of all languages in NP. And at the highest level, the, uh, the question that we study in, uh, uh, in this work is to what extent can uh, general purpose in IZK be sort of practical? Now, practical, practicality is an informal property. So what I want to do next is tell you about scalability. It's a concrete set of objectives that, uh, at least in our mind, sort of is going towards the direction of practicality. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about scalability. I'm gonna motivate scalability by first pointing out some inefficiencies of uh, classical in IZK constructions, okay? So that will sort of point us towards the direction of scalability. To tell you about these inefficiencies, I'm gonna use a concrete language, some universal language L, consisting of pairs M and T, where M is a machine, T is a time-bound represented in binary, and uh, a pair MT is in the universal language if you can find the witness that makes the machine accept in utmost these steps, okay? Now, in classical NSA constructions, usually the proof is very long. It grows linearly with T. Similarly, the verification of the proof is also expensive. Uh, the running time of the verifier also grows linearly with T. And finally, maybe sometimes we don't think about the poor prover, but he also has some space complexity, and usually uh, his space complexity also grows sort of with a time bound T, okay? So it's sort of paying in space for time. Okay, now in scalability, we're gonna explicitly require not to have any of these inefficiencies. And specifically, we're gonna require that the proof only consists of uh, a, a constant number of bits, uh, depending on a security parameter. We're also requiring that verification is cheap. Specifically, the running time of the verifier should be linear in the size of the statement, not that size of X, that's just a description of the machine, plus log T. And finally, we're gonna ask that the prover is space efficient. Okay, so I don't really have an exact formula to say it, but roughly, what I want to say here is that whatever are the space requirements of the original computation, when the prover is doing a proof, hey, it's gonna pay maybe some additive overhead in space, okay? Some, some, some constant additive overhead. And you see here that nothing grows linearly with T, and at least in our mind, this sort of is giving a sign of, as T grows large, then maybe this system can scale better, okay? Let's give a name to this guy. Uh, let's call it a scalable, zero-knowledge, succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge, or, or a scalable snark uh, uh, for short. And concretely, in this paper, we're interested in, in uh, trying to obtain a working prototype of scalable snarks, okay? So that's the goal that we set out in this paper. And what I want to, want to do next is uh, to tell you about uh, some prior work. So what do we know about uh, this primitive? First thing is that we know a lot about a weaker primitive that is known as a pre-processing snark. How does it look like? Well, here's a picture. I have highlighted the differences. So while on the one hand, a pre-processing snark continues to have a short proof and a, a cheap verification, there are differences, uh, uh, or rather, it, maintain, it continues to have certain inefficiencies. Specifically, the generator has to take as an input, as an explicit circuit. Think about it as a, of size order of T for checking the trans transcript of computation. And uh, the generator pays in time and space that is linear in C to produce, this time, two public parameters. A long one, linear in C, for the prover, as proving key, and a short one, verification key, for the verifier. 
And the prover is gonna use this long proving key to produce the proof, and he is also not space efficient, because his space complexity will grow linearly with C, which is you know, at least T. Um, there's been a lot of work uh, studying uh, pre-processing snarks. They are simpler to construct, it's a relaxation. Uh, there have been works uh, studying the theoretical foundations as well as their asymptotic efficiency. And by now we also have working prototypes. Uh, actually, if you happen to be in San Diego tomorrow, together with my co-authors, we'll be presenting a, a paper where we have a, a library called LibSnark that so sort of precisely implements a, a, a pre-processing snark uh, of this sort. Okay, but it's a relaxation. What do we know about uh, what we really want? Scalable snark. Well, not much. There's basically one theorem from uh, uh, last year that says that provided that there is collision, collision resistant hashing, then it is possible to construct a transformation T that works as follows. You give it as input a pre-processing snark, such as the kind I uh, explained in the prior slide, and what it does, spits out is a scalable snark. Okay, so it kind of bootstraps the weak snark into a more efficient one. Um, the transformation builds on uh, techniques on uh, incrementally verifiable computation and proof current data. And uh, um, the main technique uh, that is used is something called recursive proof composition that I will explain in a moment. But the main point here is that while this transformation makes sense asymptotically and security-wise, it's very indirect and theoretical. And so far, there hasn't been any sort of attempt to construct a scalable snark due to concretely enormous costs when you actually get down to try to do this thing called recursive proof composition. All right, so let me tell you what we do. So in this paper, we put forward the uh, first working prototype of a scalable snark. We do so by following this, by sort of realizing this transformation. So along the way, we also demonstrate for the first time recursive proof composition in practice. The main enabler behind our work is a new technique that we call cycles of elliptic curves that allows us to circumvent uh, um, significant overheads that previously were preventing scalable snarks from being realized in practice. Okay, so that's our results. Uh, and now I wanna uh, sort of move on and uh, uh, tell you about, uh, remind you at very high level what the transformation looks like so I can sort of point out the difficulties. So I really like to first and I really like to understand this information by first focusing on a simpler case. Suppose I, all I really want to do is uh, I want to construct a scalable snark, not for a machine, but for an automaton. Okay, so there's no memory sitting around. At the highest level, the idea is to use kind of induction. You're gonna compute a proof for each step that's gonna test that the current step of computation was correct, and moreover, the prior proof that was computed before was valid. Okay, so you keep maintaining a proof of correctness of the computation so far. Pictorially, it would look something like this. You, like the, you take the machine, you let it compute one step, and you use the prover of the pre-processing snark to produce a proof pi one. There are tests to the correctness of the state S1. And you forget about this one, you just keep around S1 and pi one, and you continue. So the machine continues computing, here's the next step. And then you also consider the computation of the verifier on the prior state and prior proof. You take that together with a second step and you produce a proof for it that attests to the correct execution of both. Okay, so by induction, pi two attests to the correct computation of the first two steps of computation. Okay, so you can forget about what happened, you just keep around S2 and pi two, and you continue in this fashion, okay? And here, recursive proof composition denotes the fact that the prover is reasoning about an MP statement that contains in it a computation about the proof system's own verifier, okay? And this thing, as, as you continue, doesn't blow up because the verifier is kind of succinct, okay, is, is, uh, is efficient. Okay, so this is how you do it for an automaton. What happens if you have memory sitting around, maybe some tape or, random, or a random access memory? I don't wanna get into it, let me just say that there is a way to reduce to step one by using collision resistant hashing. So for now, let's just focus on this uh, recursive proof composition. I wanna sort of point out that, uh, you know, once again, even though it makes sense asymptotically, concretely, it's gonna be a very heavy component. So let's try to understand why. Um, so the pre-processing snark that we're using to produce proofs understands so natively an MP-complete language, which is circuit satisfiability. This means that we have to construct a circuit that kind of looks like this. It's a circuit that has various checks, including a sub-circuit, CV, that implements the proof system's verifier, okay? This picture is not quite faithful. It's uh, a more accurate picture would be something like this, where sort of, the, I wanna claim that when, you, when it gets down to writing a circuit for the verifier, it's gonna be very costly. 
Now, why is that? So there's a number of reasons uh, that actually cause this to be the case, but I want to focus on one particular one that is uh, easiest to talk about here. It's uh, something I could call, that I'd like to call a characteristic mismatch. And the reason why I chose, choose to focus on this particular, this, this particular dis difficulty is that it motivates a very interesting mathematical question. So let's explore this characteristic mismatch. So this problem arises from the following. So in pre basically all known pre-processing SNARK constructions, we have to use pairings, okay, in the verifier. And as you know, a pairing is usually instantiated using a pairing-friendly elliptic curve, okay? Now, suppose that we actually go ahead and do that and take a SNARK and you base it, say, on an elliptic curve that is defined over a field of characteristic Q, okay? And the curve has, uh, say, R points on it, okay? Then, so I won't explain why, but I'll just state as a fact, the following happens. The prover knows how to prove the circuit satisfiability of arithmetic circuits over a field FR, okay? So there's a concrete NP-complete language that the prover understands. On the other hand, the corresponding proof generated by the prover is checked by the verifier by conducting arithmetic over a different field, FQ. So how are we going to minimize the size of a circuit CV that has to be written over FR but wants to reason about FQ? Right? There may be a characteristic mismatch here. So the natural reaction here would be to say, you know, big deal, let's just pick an elliptic curve where Q equals R and get to work. Okay, so then just write the circuit. So that leaves the fields match up. Turns out, however, it's a very simple fact that every pairing friend elliptic curve is such that Q cannot equal R. This is just impossible. Okay? It's a bit of a bummer because now we have to deal with the fact that Q is not equal to R, and we have to simulate FQ arithmetic using FR arithmetic, kind of go down to the bit level and the reason about overflow, and this will incur like a, a log Q overhead, okay, which is, you know, Q is a cryptographically large prime, so it's like two orders of magnitude right there already. And actually, for a while, <clears throat> we were of the opinion that precisely because of these reasons, recursive proof composition in practice just is not worth it. However, in this paper, we put forward a new technique that we call cycles of elliptic curves uh, that allows us to circumvent both difficulties. Roughly, the idea is as follows. So in the top, in the top half of the slide, I'm putting the naive idea that incurs a characteristic mismatch, and uh, in contrast to that, we suggest to use multiple snarks that jointly satisfy a special property. So suppose I have two snarks. The first one is based on an elliptic curve E alpha defined over FQ that has R points. And suppose the second snark is instead based on a second elliptic curve, E beta, that is defined over FR and has Q points. Okay, notice the switch of parameters here. Now forget for a moment where these elliptic curves come from, say we have them. Then what we could do is something like this. We let each snark handle the other snark's verifier. So for example, the prover P alpha would prove the satisfiability of the circuit C alpha that contains in it a sub-circuit that does not reason about V alpha, but about V beta. Why? Because now the fields match up. Okay, because I set it up so. Right? No characteristic mismatch. Okay, but all of this crucially relies on the fact that we actually have these cycles of elliptic curves. And do they exist? And uh, miraculously, the answer is yes. And specifically, such cycles can be based on so-called MNT curves. What are these? These are just uh, prime order ordinary elliptic curves with uh, prescribed embedding degrees. What's MNT? These are named after you know, their discoverers, uh, Miyagi, Nakabayashi, and Takano. And the specific fact that we sort of uh, uh, like about these curves is a theorem uh, by Karabina and Teske from a few years ago that says that if you take the parameters Q and R and you switch them, that gives you a one-to-one -one map between MNT curves of embedding degree four and MNT curves of embedding degree six. Okay, MNT four, MNT six. This is telling us that each MNT6 curve lies on a cycle with its corresponding MNT4 curve and vice versa. That's excellent, right? Because that's the curves we're looking for. Okay, so they exist, but we're not quite done. You know, we don't only uh, want them to you know, exist mathematically, we actually need to use them and put them inside a system and construct it, okay? So we still have to discover suitable cycle parameters, okay? So par these primes Q and R, not all such pairs correspond to a cycle. And then we need to explicitly construct these elliptic curves, have the coefficients so we conduct curve arithmetic, evaluate pairings, and whatnot. 
So this brings me to you know, one of my favorite parts of a paper that uh, I have absolutely no time to tell you anything about other than just a highest level summary. The point here is that we set out on uh, a very extensive computation on a large computer cluster over the period of several months, spending about 200 core years. And we basically searched very systematically through many, many cycles to identify a cycle that uh, a, a sort of incorporates in it uh, various number theoretic properties that are very important to efficient SNARK implementations. Okay, this involves things like solving Pell equations, running the complex multiplication method, if you know what these things are. And at the end of it, so to make a long story short, this is the cycle, and you can see the two coefficients for each curve, the primes Q and R, it's a very expensive cycle. Um, but it's there, it exists, we found it, and, uh, but the cycle is just the beginning. Uh, once you have a cycle, you still have to go ahead and construct explicitly the two circuits, C alpha and C beta. There are, subs, there are verifier sub-circuits to construct. You have to be uh, uh, very careful when you build them. Uh, so in particular, one of the other sort of, uh, 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 um, contributions of this paper is a very careful implementation of uh, these uh, circuits by exploiting undeterminism to verify pairings. So once we have these two circuits, C alpha and C beta in place, you have to take this uh, uh, recursive proof composition and uh, uh, sort of put it as part of a scalable SNARK. There are many details here I'm skipping, uh, and I sort of don't have time to go over them, but I encourage you to look at our full version. What I want to finish with is, uh, what's the punchline? You know, at the end of uh, sort of this uh, um, big sort of stack of construction and recursive composition, what, what are the numbers that we get? So we can apply our system to a number of machines, uh, but concretely, let me tell you about what happens if you apply it to a simple 32-bit risk machine, okay, to construct a scalable SNARK for it. Which machine, say, TinyRAM, it was introduced here at Crypto last year. So what I want to tell you is I'm going to do a comparison, okay, for a T-step computation, as T grows, okay, to infinity, between a pre-processing SNARK, okay, that has these uh, inefficiencies, and our scalable SNARK, okay, that has been bootstrapped. And you will see the trade-offs between the two. Let's start look, look, look at uh, key sizes. In a pre-processing SNARK, the proving key grows with a time-bound T. You pay approximately half a megabyte per time step. However, in our system, for this particular machine, we have a proving key that is just 55 megabytes for any choice of T. Okay? How about proving? Proving, so first of all, in both systems, the prover incurs a, a, a cost per time step to prove computation. And we are about 500 times slower than a pre-processing SNARK. Why? Well, because we use very heavy artillery. At every time step, we are doing this recursive composition. Quite expensive. But what do we gain? We gain sort of significant savings in sort of scalability, in this space complexity. Look at the pre-processing SNARK. The poor guy is paying three megabytes per time step, okay? If you want to run for, say, a million time steps, you know, it's not a, such a large program, that's already three terabytes. However, in our system, you have just this teeny tiny prover that sort of is, you keep running over and over, and this prover fits in under a gigabyte of main memory. So it could, in principle, scale indefinitely. Actually, these numbers improve uh, if you are more careful. For instance, with four threads, you can already go, get down to less than 10 seconds per step. And essentially, now we, we, like to call about, we like to talk about verified instructions per second. It's kind of, the system has a well-defined hertz rating of computing zero-knowledge proofs. And we have about one-tenth of a hertz. It's not gigahertz, not megahertz, but you know, at least it's well-defined. Okay, so these are the numbers. Um, I want to conclude, I want to give you so three, I think, interesting open questions. The first one is, are there other cycles? I mean, T-curves are the only ones that we found. Maybe there are others. Second one is, how can one significantly improve the hertz rating? Can one go well, well above one hertz? And finally, are there alternative snark constructions that perhaps don't run into the characteristic mismatch problem? Uh, maybe they're more amenable to bootstrapping. And, uh, oh, and then I wanted to put a plug here. Um, we have a, a, a library that I mentioned earlier, a C++ library for pre-processing snarks that uh, is open source, and uh, if people want to play around with it, then it's, uh, we put it on online at the beginning of the summer, and uh, so we welcome comments or like uh, questions about the library. And I think I'm gonna conclude. Uh, this is uh, the ePrint number for our full version, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>